Welcome to Casual Friday. So I want to update you a little bit about my plans for the upcoming knit along and what, what I think that's going to look like and what it means to me. I'm going to update you on my knitting projects, including talking about a project that uh, isn't working and how I went through that decision process about why it isn't working, the options that I came up with for trying to save it, and then what I ultimately decided to do. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about retreats, specifically knitting retreats, but also other sorts of retreats, and what this sort of adult recreational education looked like 100 years ago. So let's get started. The pattern that I'm going to be re-releasing is uh, was originally a reversibly cabled scarf, and that that was it. It had one yarn weight, and it was only for a scarf. And what I'm doing with the update is I'm expanding the types of uh, yarn weights that can be used for the project, and also expanding, adding some choices for a cowl infinity scarf those two things would, would be grafted in pattern in an easier way than trying to do it off the needles. And, um, and then we'll also talk about how you can create your own reversible cables. So that's kind of what the knit along is going to look like. One of the things I have seen a couple of people remark about, about why they don't typically participate in knit alongs is that there is this uh, time constraint like everybody is working on it at the same time and there's some sort of a an end date for the knit along so that's not that's not how I'm seeing this knit along and it's not really what I'm interested in doing is having this definite end date uh, what I'm more interested in doing is creating a a package of pattern and accompanying tutorials and then creating a thread in my rocks rocks group where people can ask questions about it can post the results there's not going to be an end date there's not going to be any prizes i'm just that's not me that's not my style uh, if that's something that you look for in a knit along this probably isn't for you but i don't want anyone to feel like that oh well i don't have time to do it in the time frame that this knit along is um, set for so i i, I don't want to do it It'll be there, it'll be on my channel forever. The pattern will be available forever. The thread will be available in the Rocks Rocks group whenever you decide you want uh, to join in on it. Oh, I also wanted to just mention, I did some more research on the full fashion, fully fashion topic that I talked about last week. And then I did a video on for Technique Tuesday on the uh, type of double decrease that is commonly used in fully fashioned commercially knit garments. But when I was doing some research, I, I came across a website that had some really good, just basic information, but it, had a, it provided a lot more context for the idea of commercial knitwear being cut and sew or being fully fashioned because there really is more to it than that. It turns out there are two types of cut and sew for garment making. One is that, that a specific width of fabric is created, several yards of it, and then the pattern pieces are laid out on the fabric and they're cut out. And that's kind of what I had had in mind before. But there's another way that they do cut and sew that has a lot less waste. And that is they create a, a specific width of fabric, but it's divided into panels. There's like a different colored thread that divides the the fabric width into multiple panels wide and then it's known how large each pattern piece that's going to be used is going to be how many rows long and how many stitches wide it's going to be and so panels are also divided um, along the horizontal so you can get this width of fabric that is created that is divided up into multiple panels wide and multiple panels deep and the specific pattern pieces will fit right inside that little square panel and there's a lot less waste. So there's two ways of doing cut and sew. Then there is full fashion and shaped garments. And that, that is the section I had, to, they have a little like one and a half minute video. I had to watch the video a couple of times and reread the paragraph that accompanies the video before I realized what they were actually saying. 
And what they were saying is that that shaped and fully fashioned garments both increase the number of needles or decrease the number of needles that are in play as the fabric is knit in order to create the garment shape, which is what I had understood. But it's only if you can see those decreases or increases, which they call fashion marks, it's only then that the garment's called fully fashioned. Otherwise, if you have a shaped garment piece, where you can't see the fashion marks, it's just called shaped. And that, that really made a lot of sense to me because I had gone through all of the commercially knit garments we had in our house and I noticed that for mine, I don't have that many, but for mine, I always saw the fully fashion marks around the armholes and the sleeve caps. Sometimes I saw them around the neck, sometimes I didn't and it didn't, appear to me that these had been cut and sewn. For my husband's sweaters, which range from very fine gauge all the way up to very bulky weight, they obviously weren't cut and sewn either, but there were no, for most of them, there were no fashion marks on any of the sweaters. So his, I believe, were shaped garments, but they weren't fully fashion. So I thought that was an interesting dis distinction. Um, to make and it also then makes sense why some people call only in hand knitting also say if you're placing the the decreases away from the edge then it's full fashioned but the knitting guild association who, which runs the master hand knitting program tells you that you should always be placing your decreases and increases away from the edge and they call full fashion when they're pointing at the edge which is the way that the fully fashion marks the fashion marks tend to be pointed. I still haven't found any um, commercially knit garments in our house that have fashion marks where the decreases are in the same direction as the edges. If anybody sees something like that, I'd really love to hear about it. September is drawing to a close, but when it began, I really felt like summer was over. The temperatures had dropped a little bit, the humidity had vanished, and I could really start feeling the excitement about knitting. It's, it's September, it's always the start of a new school year. It always feels like a new year, it, a new beginning for me, even though I'm not in school and my kids aren't at home anymore starting school, it still feels like the beginning of, of something. And it's usually when my knitting really gets into high gear. Early in September when I had ordered some yarn for my daughter's sweater and it was on back order and I didn't have anything else that I wanted to knit at the moment. I knew that there were things I would be knitting later in the winter but I hadn't really given much thought about them. I knew that I would be knitting myself a sweater of some sort. I have two sweaters worth of worsted weight yarn in my stash. One is the Zwart Bliss yarn that I bought for myself from Ireland uh, last spring, and I want to design something specifically for that yarn, something special, probably somewhat complex. I haven't designed it yet. And then I have some other just plain kind of magenta-ish, purpley magenta-ish yarn in my stash that I figured would be something that I would use to knit the next sweater for myself. Now, I didn't want to start a sweater for myself right away because I knew that my daughter, the yarn for my daughter's sweater was coming and I didn't want to have two sweater projects going at once. But the longer I was waiting for uh, that yarn and the antsier I got, and the more I kept thinking about, geez, you know, when February comes around and I like to do finish it February, I'm not going to have anything to finish because I haven't started anything. And so that felt a little weird to me. And then the temperatures just exploded. We got 92 degree weather with 70 degree dew points. It's like the worst miserable summer weather we ever get in July, only we were having it in September. And so then the whole idea of knitting just wasn't, um, I wasn't feeling it. But I still hadn't gotten this yarn for my daughter. And the new issue of the deep fall issue of, of Knitty came out. And so I looked through it to see what there was and I saw a cardigan in there that I really liked. It was like, it, it, it looked like a kind of an ideal uh, fall cardigan for me to knit. I've mentioned many times that I have this three week tolerance for working on a project. 
So I know that this complex project that I'll probably be knitting out of this Wartbliss yarn is probably going to take me um, one three-week session sometime after January and then I'll put it aside and then next fall I'll finish it up and then I'll have the sweater. But I won't be able to knit that project straight through if history is any indication. But often if I'm going to knit something in the fall I am going to be able to wear it right away after, if, if I can finish it. So in the fall, I often pick some sort of project that I know that I can finish in three weeks or that I'm pretty sure I can finish. And usually that kind of a project is some sort of a cardigan um, or pullover, but typically a cardigan uh, has something interesting going on with the stitch pattern, but it's not a bunch of stockinette that would be so boring to me that I would have trouble with it but there's enough interest going on to keep me going without it being so complex that it's gonna take longer than three weeks. So I was looking through the Knitty Deep Fall and I saw this cardigan called Ensemble. And it, it was ideal to me. It's a lot of moss stitch, just moss stitch on the front and then the back there's, there's a cable pattern or panel going up the back that's reasonably simple but also reasonably interesting. And I thought that Oh, that I like. And I was looking at it and I put it in my queue and didn't want to get, again, I didn't want to get started on it right away. And then again, the yarn wasn't coming. The yarn wasn't coming. So I looked at it again and I thought, well, you know, maybe I could start it and then just put it to the side when the other yarn comes. So I started reading through the pattern and it, it called for a yarn that I hadn't heard of. It was Barocco Catena. I hadn't heard of it. And I don't usually concern myself too much with whatever the yarn um, is stated in the pattern. As long as I know what yarn weight it is, I can just substitute whatever I want. But I assumed that it was a worsted weight yarn of some sort. So it's really, and it, and it, but, but I did notice that it was 120 yards in 50 grams. And I thought, geez, that would be 240 yards in 100 grams, which is more yardage than I have in my worsted weight yarn. Usually I have about 220 yards. So maybe the yarn, this yarn is a little thinner than, than what I have in my stash. So now I'll just look at the needle size. So I'm reading down the pattern. The needle size was 10 and a half, US 10 and a half, which is, is a 6.5 millimeter needle. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense at all. That's like a bulky weight. That's the size needle you'd use for bulky weight. So I was really, then I was like, I don't know wh what is being called for in this pattern because it doesn't look like something that was knit at a loose gauge. So I went on to Ravelry and I looked up the yarn and it turns out that Barocco Catena is a bulky weight chainette yarn. So it's that constra chainette construction that causes it to have, allow it to have so much yardage. So I used two different chainette yarns earlier this year and I'd found them really interesting and when I finished the second project the first project was one where I used a blow yarn so that's a, a chainette very fine um, sort of mesh tube that they then blow fibers into like alpaca and merino or things that are soft but um, but may not hold their shape on their own might you know, not be as elastic. So they, they create this blow yarn and it has um, a lot of loft, a lot of warmth, and you get a lot more yardage out of it and it's not supposed to pill as much. That's the claim. So after I finished that project, I, I found a chainette yarn that I really liked. I made a hat out of it. I, and I, I really loved the, uh, the yarn. I just I loved the process of knitting with that chainette yarn. So I used the leftovers to swatch a cable some cables to see how well cables would work out because I'd heard that they were supposed to do well with chainette yarns and I really liked it. So I had it in the back of my head. Well, at some point I want to knit a cable project using chainette yarn, but I hadn't really, had, wasn't on the forefront and just kind of stuck in the back of my head. So I'm looking at this, this sweater pattern it calls for a bulky weight yarn, which I don't have in my stash. And it would mean that I would have to buy yarn, which isn't something I really wanted to do. I wanted to use what I had, but it called for a chainette yarn, which I'd been wanting to use. And it was for a cabled garment. 
And I also thought that the nice thing about this um, pattern is that because it's bulky weight in terms of thickness, but not in terms of actual weight, it would weigh half as much as a sweater knit with, with the, the same uh, yardage that was applied yarn. So I thought, well, that would be, you know, be a lightweight, but it would be really warm. And that, so it, that was more interesting to me. And so then I thought, okay, I'm just gonna order that yarn and um, and then when I'm done with this other sweater, whenever that back ordered yarn comes in and I finish that sweater, then I can start the other one. Or I could start both of them and and then just have something to finish in February. You know, it's just just had that idea. So the yarn came from my daughter's sweater. I got started on it. We had a couple of days, just horrible, miserable, rainy all day weather, just awful. And then last Saturday came and the sun came out and the temperatures plummeted. It was like 45 degrees when I woke up and it was sunny and I'm like, fall is here. And I was like, I really felt like now it's knitting season. And I'd already been working on my daughter's sweater. And then I, I went and I looked on Facebook and my niece who was pregnant posted that she knows the sex of her baby. And I went, oh my gosh, I had to remember, I forgot I was going to knit a baby blanket for her and she's due in February. So I should go buy a yarn for the blanket. And then I wanted to buy some yarn for the knit along projects, the, the variations, the modifications that I'm planning that allow uh, for a cowl or infinity scarf. So that, so I need to buy some yarn for that. And I was just, it was like I was in a frenzy. Like I was so excited. I wanted to start all of the things. So I, I drove to St. Paul, to St. Paul, to the yarnery. I bought uh, yarn for a cowl, for an infinity scarf and for my uh, niece's baby blanket. Uh, I got home and in the door was the yarn that I had ordered for the Asabo cardigan. It's like, woo, you know, so I had all the yarn and I kind of was almost in such a frenzy. I didn't even know what to do next, but I wanted to continue working on my daughter's sweater. So I got to a certain point and I was, ch and I always check my gauge, even if I'm pretty sure, you know, I'm confident about the yarn that I'm using. If I've used it before and I know that my gauge was fine. I, I always continue to check just to make sure I'm getting what I think I should be getting. So I made this sweater once before earlier this, this spring, I made it for my younger daughter using Cascade 220, which is the standard uh, worsted weight wool, Peruvian Highland wool, uh, not machine washable, which I've used a million times. And it worked out fine. But the yarn that I was using for my older daughter's sweater while it was Cascade 220, it was Superwash Merino. So, and I'd never knit with it before and it's a little more slippery. And I was checking my gauge and I noticed my row gauge, I seem to have a, a more rows per inch than I had in the regular Cascade. And I just wasn't sure, I wasn't sure if that was because the yarn was more slippery and maybe I was unconsciously knitting tighter uh, I didn't know what would happen when I washed it because Superwash does have a tendency to grow. So I thought, you know, I'm going to stop here because I was heading to the underarms and I do want to make sure, well, I do this a lot where I just wash and block a sweater right before the underarms to make sure that if it's going to grow any at all, that I know that I, that I end up with the actual length I want rather than knitting it to the length I, that I think I should have and then I wash it later and it ends up growing. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to just uh, wash it and uh, I'm going to soak it and, and then block it and, and see what happens with the gauge with this and see if, if the stitch gauge is right and it's just the row gauge or, or what, what's going on. So soaking it, well, then I didn't have anything to knit, uh, but I had all this yarn that I just got that day. So I decided to go ahead and start the Asabo sweater. So I opened the, the package and I left all the yarn in, in the, um, it's like one of those plastic bag shipping envelopes. I just opened it up and I, and I opened the bag of yarn. I pulled the first one out and it was exactly what I thought it was when I had ordered it. I'd ordered it from Webbs and they, when I was looking up, oh, when I was looking up the Katana and I saw that it was a bulky weight chainette, I just looked up, well, who else makes a bulky weight chainette yarn? And there were eight or 10 other yarns, but they all sounded European and they, they weren't brands I was familiar with. 
and I know that I can get Barocco here in the US. So I just went on and I know that Webs sells it. So I just went on to their website to see how many colors it came in and they had 22 colors. So I looked at all of the colors and I had chosen this one called Renoir. Most of the yarns had names that were like minerals, like platinum or anthracite or you know whatever and then there were a few at the bottom that had names of fresh uh, French impressionist paint painters so like Renoir or Degas or Monet things like that and I saw the one that I had picked out was called Renoir and it was kind of a magenta-y heathery looking yarn and a, a number of the other yarns were just completely solid or kind of looked heathery so this one looked similar to those, except it was a color that I really liked. So I pulled the ball out was what I expected and I started knitting with it and getting to know the pattern. I was, you know, reading through the pattern, making sure I had everything set up. And after about three or four rows, I noticed the color started to shift and it was getting a little darker. And I'm like, well, I didn't expect that. And so I'm pulling the yarn out of the center because the outside of the ball was the same color as it was from the inside. And, so, and it's like getting darker and darker. Like, I don't know if it's a really deep purple or if it's black, I can't, I can't tell. So I'm pulling and pulling it and I'm like, okay, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> so then I went on to the Barocco website and I saw they had pictures of all of the balls of yarns. All the ones with mineral names were balls. And then the ones that were French Impressionist they had swatches and you could see that they were color changing. So I started thinking about that and I'm like, okay, well, the long color changes aren't going to muddy the cable pattern. Like that's something that I normally would worry about with a variegated yarn is that it would just completely obscure the cable pattern on that back panel. So I wasn't worried about that, but I wasn't sure how I felt about the striping and I didn't know how it was going to play out. So I went ahead and I finished the first ball and then I kind of just put it to side and I had to sleep on it and to try to decide is this what I want this sweater to be like? It wasn't what I expected it to be like and, and what are the, going to be the challenges associated with using a slow color changing striped yarn with this particular pattern? I've, I've done this before. I've used ombre yarns where I've, I've done things where I wanted uh, two things to match, like two socks to match. And I've used color changing yarns where I, I knew I wasn't going to try to make everything match up in each piece of, of a sweater pattern. But I also chose to deliberately make the pattern pieces sized in a way that it wasn't going to look weird. And, and here's the other thing, you don't always know <laughs> with a color changing yarn, if the wool was dyed and then it was spun, or if the, if the wool was spun and then it was dyed. So if it was dyed afterwards and they, they completely control the color changing and they're very, it's very regular. But other types of, of yarns are not that way. If it's dyed in the wool and then it's spun, then you aren't guaranteed that the color sequences are going to be the same each time. So for something like a sock like I have here that was this ombre yarn, in order for the color sequence to continue working just down the front of the sock, I had to stop, um, I, I had to knit the heel from a different part of the ball and turn the heel that way. And that, and that allowed the color sequence to continue down the front, otherwise, like if you've ever knit with self-striping yarn, you know that the stripes get a lot whiter on the heel flap and then it, by the time you turn the heel and you rejoin, the color sequence is interrupted. You have different stripes there and also the stripes are tend to be narrower because you have a lot more stitches and it takes a while before the stripes return to being the same width. So with an ombre yarn, you have that same challenge, but then you have the challenge of trying to find the exact same starting point in the second sock if you're trying to make them match because the, the color shifts so gradually it's it's really tricky so i managed to do that with this pair of socks and i thought that <laughs> that was a lot of work i was glad i did it but i wasn't thrilled with how much work it took in order to get that to happen so i don't know I think it's six, six and a half years ago now when I was waiting for my results of the master hand knitting program, I did the Craft Yarn Council's uh, certified knitting 
instructor and certified knitting teacher program. So the second level one, the certified knitting teacher, one of the things you had to do was to design a beginner sweater, write the pattern and you had to knit it. And then you had to, to send it in. So I didn't want to knit something that was so basic and just, just only rectangle. Like I didn't want to knit one of those super, super simple sweaters because I wouldn't enjoy knitting it and I wouldn't enjoy wearing it. So I asked the, the, my teacher, like, how beginner can it be, you know, and can, as long as it's a knit pearl pattern and can I do this and that? She said, yes. So I knew it was something that I would at least want to be able to wear, but I didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I went to a big box store and I got some acrylic yarn and it's a color changing yarn. So it's, it's a kind of a, it's this kind of color changing yarn. And, but I knew that if I knit the whole body, the both fronts and the back as one, the stripes would be fairly narrow. And then when I did the sleeves, they would be a lot wider. And, and that might look a little funny. So, and I didn't want to work too hard at trying to match things either. I thought I'll just let it kind of, however each piece starts or ends, I'm just going to go with that. But I'll, I'll knit the, each front separately and the back separately so that none of the stripes are super, super narrow. And that way the fronts, the fronts are, you know, half as, half as, as wide as the back. And so those stripes are going to be um, wider than they are in the back, but then they'll match sort of with the sleeves. There just, there'll be enough differences going on that, um, that it will deceive that, that the eye won't won't find it disruptive. So so I did um, do this this sweater and you know it's funny, it's this acrylic sweater I really didn't care about and I would get compliments on it every time it worked because people really liked the colors. And so in this case I didn't like I didn't worry about uh, the sleeves matching up, you know stripe ways with each other or with the body. And the front and the back, you can see at the seams, um, they don't line up exactly right. And they're not the same widths. But again, I mixed it up enough that it, I thought it would work. So the problem is with this sweater that I was knitting with this Barocco Catena is that the fronts and the back are being knit at the same time. It's a bottom-up sweater and it has raglan sleeves. So that means I'm going to have to join the sleeves to the body and then knit the yoke at the top at one time. And that was going to be a challenge because then I would want the tops of the sleeves and the top of the body to all be around the same color when I join them together so that there would be at least some continuity going. But the, the stitch counts were going to be so vastly different for the different parts of the, each of these that I wasn't sure how I could handle that. Would I, would I try to make the sleeves match each other? And would I try to make the sleeve widths, uh, the stripe widths match what was in the body? You know, all, all of this stuff was going through my head and I thought, well, I'm just gonna start the second ball and see what happens just, just with, the, with that. So here's, here's what I have so far. And um, it's, it's pretty. But it's not what I wanted. I wanted something I could knit in three weeks and it wouldn't be too hard. And I thought the color is just complicating it to the point where I don't even want to think about it. I didn't, <laughs> so, so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna send the yarn back. I'm gonna keep these two balls because obviously I've been using them and they'll be fine for a hat or a scarf or whatever. I can use one or two balls and an accessory, but it's not what I want to use for sweater. So I ordered a solid color um, and they're shipping it out and I'll get it probably next week. But I, I just wanted to, to share that with this, this idea of, it, I, I like the yarn, I like the color, I like the sweater pattern, but it's, it's not it's not going to work together for me, not in a way that I am going to find enjoyable. So I would rather rip out a ball and a half of yarn than continue on um, with this.
Okay, so this weekend I am going on a knitting retreat. Now I've been on a couple of knitting retreats in the past. A few years ago I went out to one in Washington. It was one of these retreats that are mostly focused on classes where you're taking uh, a class all day from one teacher each day for three days and you're rotating with your group. So you get each of the three teachers and you're rotating with it. And there's plenty of time in the evening for um, so social knitting and they provide all the meals for you and it's in a beautiful setting and it was a really it was a wonderful type of retreat but that was very focused on sort of educational it was an educational retreat and the one that I'm going on this weekend is through the Minnesota Knitters Guild and that one I had gone on once before a year and a half ago and for some reason I was really nervous to go on that retreat and I think it was because it was uh, it was local knitters. It was those people that I perhaps had had seen in the past and would see in the future. I didn't know if everyone else was going to know each other. I didn't know how I'd fit in. It so I was a little concerned. The thing about these kinds of organizations where you have a monthly meeting with a program is that you come together once a month for the for the monthly program and most of the meeting is that program so you're sitting there watching somebody talk about an interesting topic and then there's a little bit of time before and after where you can chat with people but it's really hard to make friends that way like actually make friends like that and that that was an experience I had with our local writers group where I always felt like yeah, you come once a month you come for the program you might chat a little bit with the person next to you but you didn't really get to know anybody. So it was when I started volunteering for the organization and then I was on the board and then I was a, I was in a writer's group and a critique group with some of the people. That's when I really made my writer friends and you know friends that I've had now for, for 20 years. So I knew that that was a similar thing for the Knitters Guild, that in order for me to really make friends in the guild, I needed to participate, I needed to volunteer, I needed to go on retreats, or if they had some special outing, you could sign up to do something like that. So, I could, so it would give me an opportunity to actually get to know somebody besides just sitting next to somebody while the program is being presented to us. So I went to that retreat and and it, it's a really, it's, I really loved this retreat because it was uh, all the meals are provided. <laughs> you have to bring your own bedding and stuff. All the meals are provided. There's this big lodge where everybody just creates a big oval of, of seats and we all just sit there knitting. But it's like 20 to maybe 30 people and so everybody fits in there and you're with them all day every day and then you're um, eating with them and you have the option of doing a few extra things if you want like you could sign up to get a massage which I did you could sign up um, to take a dyeing class with somebody from three Irish girls and I did that and that was super fun because I you know you just kind of learn how does that dyeing process work so that that I just had the best time so I've been looking forward to this retreat since I was driving home from that previous retreat and that one was a year and a half ago they used to always do them in February and then they decided because they're all, the guild also does yarn over it's their big event in in April it's too much at one time so they have moved it to September and I think it's a good choice because I the fall colors are probably going to be beautiful it's gonna be on a lake um, it's just going to be really nice. I'm looking forward to it. One of the things that has always struck me though about these retreats is that they seem to be a very post mid 20th century modern idea to me. Like I couldn't imagine my grandparents doing something like that, like going away for a weekend to, to do some sort of adult recreational education and relaxation weekend. I, I just, I couldn't imagine that. So I don't know if my grandparents ever did something like that. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But what I have realized is that this isn't really a mid-century invention or post-mid-century invention, this idea of, of a retreat or adult recreational education. A couple of years ago, when I was coming back from visiting my family in Michigan, I wanted to stop in this little town in, in southern Wisconsin and do some genealogical research. My mother's father's family was from Darien, Wisconsin. 
and my grandpa wasn't born there, but his father and his grandfather um, were born there and his uh, great grandfather migrated there from New York in 1840. And so they were pioneers there and they got the original land patents, the, the whole extended family uh, moved there at the same time. They all had farms around each other and they stayed there for three generations. So I had done some research I knew, you know, birth and death and marriage dates for some of the stuff. I, I didn't have as much information as I, as I wanted. I couldn't get it all online. So I wanted to stop. I wanted to go to the cemetery. I wanted to take pictures of the headstones, get some dates that I wasn't quite sure on. I wanted to go to the county courthouse and get death certificates and maybe some marriage certificates and possibly some birth records as well. And then the last thing that I was going to do was I was going to go to the library and then look up obituaries. Once I had firmed up certain death dates, I was going to go look up obituaries on microfilm at the library because that would probably give me more insight into their lives that I could get just from census record and land records and a couple of marriage dates. So I showed up at the library a few hours before I was ready to, to drive back to Minnesota and I talked to the librarian and she showed me where the microphone was. It turns out there were two newspapers in the county and they were, they were both uh, published in a town that was 10 miles away from Darien. So my family was from Darien and then it was in Delavan where these two newspapers were published just 10 miles down the road. And back in those days, newspapers were, were published once a week and they were distributed through the whole county. And so there was, there was news from all the little townships um, within the county and they would have a little column and it would have the name of the township. And then you'd see all these little, I would call them news bits, a little little sentence or two, a whole bunch of them from for each of the townships. And these kinds of things were like J.F. Rood, you know, went to Beloit this weekend uh, to see to see his cousin or, you know, something like that. It, it was like the Facebook of the 19th century. So it was just these little charming little bits. And I've anytime I've looked up obituaries in these old newspapers, I have just loved looking through the township news because it was just it was just so interesting and it give gave gives a different sort of insight into people's lives than what you get from an obituary. But I never dreamed that I'd be able to find anything like that on any of my ancestors because you wouldn't know what what newspaper to look in to, to look for some kind of information like that. You know when an obituary is probably going to be published if you have their death date, but you don't know when they're going to talk about having gotten a new wagon or that their barn burned down. You just don't know. So it's getting ready to, to, to pull out the microphone and the librarian mentioned that one of the papers was only on microfilm. The other one was on microfilm, but it had been digitized up through 1924. And that, that you could look at it from any computer anywhere in the world, which was, a, it's, which is an interesting thing because the Wisconsin public library system has a lot of digitized information available to Wisconsin residents. So if you are outside of Wisconsin, you can't access that information. So she was telling me that not only was this newspaper digitized and available to look at on any computer, I could look at it on any computer outside of Wisconsin. And so I, I thought that is fantastic. And then she looked at it and she's like, oh, this, the connection's not working and I have to put in a troubleshooting request. So it's not available right now, but it will be up probably in the next few days or something. But in the meantime, go look at the microfilm. So I looked up what I could in the microfilmed newspaper and then I left the library, I drove home, and then I kept checking every, every day. I kept checking to see if the digitized newspaper was available. Was it available? Was it available? And the librarian finally emailed me a couple of weeks later and said, it's back up. You can look at it. So I was like, oh, good. So I went and what it is, they, they had scanned all the newspapers and then they had run it through OCR, optical character, character recognition software, which reads the text. And sometimes it can read it really well and sometimes it doesn't do so well. But what it allows you to do is search uh, for specific words in the newspapers. So I thought, well, I'm gonna just search for the family's last name, which is Rood, R-O-O-D. And in the past, when I've searched on 
the rude surname, like in a specific geographic area, a lot of times the the and the hits that I get are the word road, R O A D. So, and I wasn't expecting to get that my ancestors would be in the paper very much. You know, they were farmers. Why would they? You know, just didn't expect it. So I type in R O O D, and I say search, and I got. 70 pages, I think, something like that, 60 or 70 pages of results. Each page was 50 issues of the newspaper. And I thought, and it wasn't in chronological order. So I th I'm like, this is like the entire newspaper, like the only, they just put it out of order. And I thought, it's just going to be the word road in every one of these. It's not going to even, and I couldn't understand what was going on. So I look in the first issue sure enough, there's an ancestor of mine, somebody rude in there. And it really was. And it, there were a few different things in that particular newspaper. It turns out the results are presented in order of likelihood that it's a good hit. So page 70, those results probably aren't very good. Those might be the ones that have road in them. But the first, the first ones are good. But it was really overwhelming. In order for me to copy these, I could copy the text and then I had to correct. It was, it was, it was kind of labor intensive to get the, the information that was in the newspaper on my computer into a document. And it was all out of chronological order. So I spent the next month or two going through each one of these newspapers and looking for, you know, the hits and, and then putting them in chronological order and correcting the, the, the text problems that, you know, from converting and going through the, and once I got everything in chronological order, I could read through and I could really see the lives of these people. They were, they were in, they literally were in almost every newspaper after about 1885 because they were friends with the town correspondent who was the one responsible for sending the news to the newspaper. But they were just, they just were in there all the time. And I, instead of getting, you know, a, a snapshot of somebody on a census record and then five, five years later on another census record and then maybe on a marriage record, I was getting weekly snapshots of their lives. And it completely changed how I viewed them. I thought these were simple farm people who were not exposed to anything in the world and and probably didn't ever go anywhere. And that couldn't have been further from the, from the truth. They were, they were going on the train to Chicago and Milwaukee and Beloit and you know various different places. And then I saw in one issue that a family member had gone to Janesville to see Barnum's Museum. And I was like, I wonder if that's like the circus, like Barnum Circus. So I was looking it up and it turns out, yes, Barnum, he had all these exotic animals and he had all these people from exotic lands that would travel around. So it was like a traveling museum. And not only that, but Barnum, when he started his circus in 1871, he bought all of this land in Delavan as the winter home of his circus. But he wasn't the only one. There were 28 circuses that had their winter homes in Delavan. So my family, who I thought were so isolated from the world, were living <laughs> surrounded by circus people. Apparently they had, you know, elephants walking down the street and zebras grazing in the pastures and whatever. And there's very few photographs of this because it was such a common sight. People just didn't take photos of it. So, so that changed my perspective of, um, of what was going on. And it also cleared up why when I'm driving through Wisconsin, there were these big billboards for the Circus World Museum. I never understood that. Wisconsin had circus, like hundreds of circuses that had their winter home there in the, in the 19th century. And I had, I had no idea. The first circus that bought land was these two brothers who had who had moved to Wisconsin when it was territory and they bought farmland and then they decided to do some kind of traveling. They had a tent show and then a traveling show. And so they bought a bunch of, of land there that what they called their last name was Maybe, M-A-B-I-E, and they bought this land that they called uh, Maybe Wood. And then eventually all the other circuses came, including Barnum. Well, the end of the 1800s and 1898, something like that, the descendants of the Maybe brothers 
decided to sell maybe would they decided to sell their property and my great great grand uncle who was the town doctor uh, he was in the newspaper because he had bought um, some land a couple of acres of land uh, and it said in maybe would just south of the assembly grounds and I, I remember seeing this in the newspaper the assembly grounds the assembly grounds I'm like what is the assembly grounds I don't understand what this is well it turns out that in Chautauqua, New York, some point in the mid to late 1800s, this idea of bringing lecturers and other kinds of guest speakers and musicians and all this kind of stuff to an area in like a, a camp atmosphere with cabins or whatever, that, that this would be a way to bring culture to people in in. Uh, the United States. And so they would have these, they called them Chautauqua camps. So the original one was in Chautauqua, New York, but they had these Chautauqua assemblies all over the place. The assembly grounds in Delavan originally had been circus, circus land and, and maybe wood was part of that. And the, so that, so the circus land became the assembly grounds and then people were able to buy plots of land in what had been maybe wood. And they had cabins there and then in the summertime they would have a two-week period or one or two week period where where people could go there and then they would have all these lectures and and they would be out in nature and they would be on a, on the shores of a lake and in the woods and it would just be a beautiful place to re, to relax and get some sort of adult recreational education so this is something that it's you know been going on for more than a hundred years. The the idea of a retreat it really isn't a new idea. So so this weekend when I'm up sitting in the camp lodge, knitting by the fireplace in my circle of knitter friends, I can look out on the lake on Cross Lake, and I can think about my ancestors going to Lake Delavan in the summertime. Um, for their little summertime retreat and uh, adult educational, adult recreational education. So that's it for this week. If you like my videos and want to show your appreciation, you can buy me a coffee on Kofi.com. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks, Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.